Jimmy Song, Jim Bianco, welcome back to Real Vision. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. It's such a pleasure to have both of you guys here today uh, to host this conversation, to bring different perspectives on this digital asset space. Uh, before we get started, let's give a little bit about your background so we can frame the context for the conversation. Uh, Jimmy uh, Song, why don't you go first? Give us a little bit of a background for people who don't already know. I'm sure people have seen you many times on Real Vision and elsewhere, but give us a little bit of context for your background and how you found your way into the Bitcoin space. Sure. I've been a programmer all my life. Uh, I, I've been uh, a, a professional programmer for something like the last 23 years. And, uh, and I got into Bitcoin back in 2011. Um, and I, I saw it from two different perspectives. I saw it from an economics perspective. I thought it was uh, sound money uh, when I first heard about it. And I heard about the 21 million limit. And I saw it as a technical um, uh, innovation as well, because uh, I, I saw that it was using public key cryptography and all of the different um, uh, clever mechanisms that that came into making Bitcoin work. Uh, so uh, for me, uh, my, my background is very much technical and I, I do teach this stuff. So I, I'm very familiar with the ins and outs of the protocol itself. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, uh, having studied some Austrian economics and uh, knowing what sound money looks like and what it's supposed to do and so on. Uh, I think Bitcoin to a large degree is um, sort of like the ideal in terms of portability um, and uh, ability to store value over time as well. So Jim Bianco, you have also been on Real Vision multiple times. I'm sure our audience knows you, but a little bit of context on your background uh, and how you found your way into Bitcoin and digital assets more broadly. So I'm a, a traditional TradFi guy. Uh, I've been around the, the markets for decades. Uh, I was actually getting a paycheck during the 1987 stock market crash. That's how far back I go back in TradFi. I joined Bitcoin a little bit later than Jimmy. I kind of got involved in it in the summer of 2017, maybe the spring of 2017 uh, as well. And I kind of became very interested in it. And then coming out of uh, the, the winter of 2018, being a TradFi guy, I discovered decentralized finance. And I found when I saw it, I almost instantly saw its potential as a disruptive force for the traditional financial services industry. And what I've been more interested in is the whole DeFi boom and what the DeFi boom can mean in terms of the future of finance, in addition to the future of money, as Jimmy was talking about with sound money, uh, with Bitcoin and some other aspects of, about it as well too. Yeah, so this is fascinating. We have a lifelong professional programmer with an interest in finance and economics, and we have a lifelong uh, financial person with an interest in technology. Uh, it's an interesting meeting of the minds to have this conversation. So let's talk a little bit uh, before we get into DeFi uh, about Bitcoin. Jim, I'm curious, uh, so you talk about coming into Bitcoin. What was it that you recognized from a traditional finance perspective that made you think that Bitcoin was something that was viable, that had legs, that had the potential to really change the way that we do things? I ask this question specifically uh, because there are many people, obviously, in the traditional finance space who were very much Bitcoin skeptics at the beginning. In fact, some who are Bitcoin skeptics still today, what was it that you recognized as someone with a background in traditional finance that made you think that this was something that you wanted to spend your time learning about? I think it was more along the lines of what decentralized finance was going to bring to the space. The history of technology has always been that it creates a better, faster way to do things by cutting out the middleman. And then by cutting out the middleman, it allows for creativity and this Cambrian explosion of ideas to take place. We've seen that with the invention of email, with the invention of the internet, just going with some recent things with the platform companies uh, as well too. But two, two areas that it really, technology has not been able to make a dent in in any ways has been healthcare and financial services. But now with, decentralized finance and the removal of the banks or the potential removal of the banks out of a lot of their uh, basic businesses, not every business, but deposit taking and collateralized lending and automatic market making or um, brokerage operations and insurance. I saw within this space 
the raw, if you want to call it the beta of a new financial system. It's not ready yet for prime time. It's not ready to take to the real economy and say, here you go, here's a better system. But you can see where this is going to be in a couple mm. of years. You could see where it's going. And I definitely think it can be, and it can be a disruptive force that could lead to lower costs, more accessibility to financial services, and a lot more creativity than we've ever seen in financial services. And that's what got me very interested in this space. I want to throw back over to Jimmy Song. I'm curious, you know, Jimmy, you're obviously well known uh, as a Bitcoiner uh, in this space. Um, and Bitcoin obviously often, uh, at least in the popular imagination associated with the uh, digital gold use case, the store of value use case. What does DeFi mean to you? Is it something that you think about in the context of Bitcoin? Uh, is it something that you think is important? Or is that just a different framework mentally that you have? Yeah, I, I would say uh, when, when you ask, like, what, what do I think of DeFi? I think it's a complete misnomer. It has no decentralization whatsoever. It is completely centralized. There's uh, somebody capturing value, usually through a token that doesn't really need to be there. Um, and it's, uh, it's all an excuse in order to, uh, you know, uh, create sort of like a speculative frenzy. And this has been going on in the altcoin space since 2011. Uh, you know, there, the, this is sort of like over and over again what uh, people um, think of as I didn't get in early enough on Bitcoin, therefore I will get into all of these random altcoins uh, in some way, shape, or form. And DeFi is no exception. Uh, it's not decentralized at all. Um, you know, we we just had uh, I think Mark Cuban uh, who invested in some DeFi protocol and he had the world pulled out under him. He lost all his money because the protocol token went to zero uh, because uh, you know the the people that created it were like, hey, you suckers, I'm, we're just going to take the money. Um, that that sort of thing is so uh, like amazingly common in the DeFi space. And uh, and the thing is, you, you if it actually were trying to be a, a new sort of like a financial services paradigm or something like that, then then you could do everything with Bitcoin. Uh, the fact that they want to create their own token and create a speculative fre uh, speculative frenzy around it tells me that it's not about that at all. It's a, uh, it's all about getting the speculative frenzy going. Uh, because you printed your own money, you can you can sort of like cash in for the people that created the token and so on. Um, so for me, it's a, it, it really isn't anything, and it, it's uh, it's the same old story. We we've we've seen it over and over again. Uh, I think Jim mentioned that. There's like a Cambrian explosion of new things uh, in the Bitcoin space, uh, or at least many of us that are Bitcoin maximalists, we call it the Scambrian explosion of 2011, 2013, 2017, now 2021. Uh, it, it's a continuous sort of like scammy speculative frenzy that continues to happen. And each time, you know, uh, we're, we're out there warning people, hey, don't, don't go into these ICOs, don't do these like, uh, you know, stupid things that you don't really understand. Uh, you know, if you don't understand what's going on, you're probably the yield, and uh, very, uh, and that very much is true. Um, instead, people insist on investing in stuff that they don't understand because of the speculative frenzy, and that's it. That that that's what's been happening. If I could jump in there, um, I'm going to partially agree with Jimmy that the history of technology has always been that two things tend to happen at the same time, and one of them is some kind of a new idea, new approach is being done. And you can go back to the early days of the internet with this as well too. And there's also wild speculation on that. If you know, and you could go back and you could look at the tech bubble in late 99 and early 2000. And the history has always been too, that most of the new ideas fail, but the few that don't become transformative uh, along the way. And some of the ideas that fail tend to be the right idea and are not executed properly. As an example, late 99, early 2000, if you would have said, I think e-commerce is going to be the biggest thing ever, and you would have said, great, what do I invest in? Buy Pets.com and buy Amazon. They're the two biggest e-commerce plays of late 99. Pets.com went to zero. Amazon went from $100 to 94. So now you've got a minus 100% loss and a minus 94% loss. And by late 01, you would have said, yeah, this, this e-commerce thing, there's nothing to it. And then Amazon went from $6 to 3,300. And we all know where e-commerce where e is. This space is going to be no different. 
there's going to be a lot of scams in this space. There's going to be a lot of problems in this space. By the way, the, the Cuban thing with Iron Finance might be more of a bad, badly written smart contract uh, than a, a, a straight rug pull. I know I might be splitting hairs about what the difference between the two is, but it was supposed to have a million, it was supposed to have a million tokens it, limit and it printed 27 trillion. And so it's that what's their problem was um, right there. And this is part of the learning process and this is part of the risk in the space but i think that when 80 or 90 percent of these go away the 10 or 20 or maybe five percent that stay can truly be transformative especially for the financial services industry well i, I i've heard this argument over and over uh you know including coins from it's, 2011. It's the, <laughs> it's the history of how it works well, well the, the thing is uh you, like none of the stuff from 2011 actually survived other than Litecoin. And I wouldn't say Litecoin is this amazing innovation. Uh, 2013, there were a whole bunch of other ones too. Um, and, you know, no, nobody remembers any of them and they're, they're not known for their innovation. Um, I, I think you're overestimating the innovative capacity of a lot of these coins. They're, they're yeah, mostly you know, just in, copycats in the, of something else. In the I, next I mean, case. The Netscape Navigator didn't survive. MySpace essentially didn't survive either. And newer yeah, and better things I, I, come I, along all the time. So there oh. is always an evolutionary process. Yes, version 1.0 is not supposed to survive. It's supposed to lead to 2.0 and 3.0 and 4.0. And those are the ones that wind up becoming true, truly transformative. That's why I said we still might be in the beta format of where we're going to go with this in terms of decentralized finance. Well, so I, I, I don't agree that this is, uh, you know, MySpace or the Model T or some, something like that, because this is about money. And the thing is, uh, the, the analogy, everyone sort of like comes from a particular framework, especially uh, people that are investors in the last 20 years. All they see is it's tech, 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 and that's it. Um, when in fact, this is actually money. And uh, the, the most important thing about money is not about innovating and getting this newest feature or something to that effect, which is true of Facebook or, uh, or a car or something like that. But this is money. It's, it's way more important to have long-term credible scarcity about the money rather than, oh, we have this new feature, this extra way of doing uh, uh, smart contracts or uh, some, some um, you know, new way of doing collateralized lending or something like that. Th those aren't that important. Uh, it, uh, nearly as much as credible long-term scarcity. And this is why I, I find a lot of these quote-unquote innovations completely useless because in a sense, you're, you, you have to trust this third party in order to uh, do all of these like uh, interesting quote-unquote um, uh, DeFi things. Uh, when, when in fact the the real innovation is in long term credible scarcity, uh, and that that that's what we get with Bitcoin. It's actually decentralized. Um, everything else, uh, all all of these uh, you know innovations or whatever, they 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 have no actual credi credibility. It's just hey, trust us, and we're going to make it completely centralized. We're going to value capture through these tokens and uh, print uh, print our own token or whatever. Um, I, I really don't think there's uh, innovation here. And, and I've, I've been watching this space for 10 years. You keep saying, okay, well, you know, the ones that survived, they're going to be completely transformative. Um, the, there, there have been ones that survived 10 years, as a matter of fact, and they, they haven't uh, innovated anything. Uh, <laughs> that's just reality. You talk about credible long-term scarcity. What does that phrase mean to you and why is Bitcoin different and why does it possess those attributes of credible long-term scarcity in your view? Yeah, so credible long-term scarcity is uh, it, it is what gives it sort of value over the long term. So if it, uh, the US dollar is no longer credibly scarce, I think, over the long term, uh, especially since uh, the M2 money supply went from 15.5 trillion to 19.5 trillion in, the, in a matter of like 12 months. Um, that That's an extreme uh, expansion of the money supply, and we can see it. Um, and even the CPI numbers, which are heavily manipulated and so on. Uh, like the thing is like uh, when, when you have a credible long-term scarcity for Bitcoin means it's 21 million and that's it. It's not changing at all. Um, whereas 
something like Ethereum, the monetary policy is changing every six months. Um, if you look at the chart for their uh, monetary policy, it's it's changed like uh, a dozen times in its uh, in its lifetime, uh, several times in a couple of months, uh, as a matter of fact, because they they forgot to do something. Um, and this is true of every altcoin, is, is that they, they do change their monetary policy based on whatever uh, the central controllers of those do uh, 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 decide on. And this is the real problem with all of these uh, altcoins uh, of, uh, of various stripes, is that they aren't decentralized. They have a central controller. They have somebody that, that changes things. And when you don't have that long-term credible um, scarcity, then it's really not very different than fiat money. Um, and uh, just to bring home the point about sort of like technology versus like credible scarcity being the more important thing, Right now, the U.S. dollar can add all sorts of features, right? You can add smart contracts, you can add collateralized lending, you can, you can do all sorts of little bells and whistles. Would people still want the dollar? Probably not, uh, because it, it's, uh, in the end, the U.S. Federal Reserve can, um, can print uh, more money whenever they want to, uh, and therefore people will not right. want to hold it. The reason why people hold it is because of long-term credible scarcity, which you have with Bitcoin, which uh, has proven itself over 12 years, uh, with, with, with all of these other DeFi protocols and altcoins and all this other stuff, you, you don't have that at all. You, you have very little credibility, in fact, and yeah. you can see rug pulls and uh, right. you know smart contract bugs, internal, external, whatever, who knows who did it or for what reason. But I mean, the, these things are showing up all the time for a reason. Well, we also right. hold U.S. dollars because we all have to remit, if you're a U.S. citizen, our federal mm -hmm. taxes uh, in U.S. dollars. And so uh, I will take U.S. dollars as payment uh, <laughs> for uh, for my services. But uh, Jim, let's talk a little bit about your view of the world. Uh, so I'm sort of in, in, in very sympathetic to both of these arguments. Uh, and it's interesting because we're talking about, I think, the world from two very different perspectives. What is it about DeFi that you find interesting let's forget about which token it's do, taking place on what are the ideas behind decentralized finance that you find uh to be innovative and that you find to have the potential uh to alter the existing financial services system well first of all i think that jimmy and i are talking about two different things you're talking yeah. about uh you're talking about a monetary unit in bitcoin and i'm not going to deny that that's exactly what it is what I think is happening with the Ethereum network and what's happening with DeFi is it's creating a financial services business around it. It's something very different. A lot of these tokens are not to be compared, I don't think, with currencies, but maybe more along the lines of a DAO with securities is really where, the, where they're saying. I mean, in your world, you would say we should close the New York Stock Exchange. We don't need ownership of any company because that's closer to alignment of what all these altcoins are supposedly trying to do. And yes, it's very easy to just announce that a lot of them are shit coins and a lot of them have no value or they've been badly written and they're going to go away, but not all of them. So what I see in this space is I think I'm comparing it not to Bitcoin, because uh, I think Bitcoin is the other side of the coin of this. You know, you've got your monetary unit in a, in a digital format, and now you've got your digital financial services uh, sector as well. That's the other side of the coin. I'm comparing it to the traditional banks and what the traditional banks do. The traditional banks have shown that they are very fragile, they're very unstable, that's why they need seven regulators to constantly look over them. That's why, to throw out a statistic for you, JP Morgan provides office space for 200 full time regulators whose 40 hour a week job is to sit in JP Morgan's offices and monitor what they're doing. That's how unstable that system is. So now, if you bring it to a decentralized finance system, and I think Jimmy overstates it. It can be more decentralized, and there are some protocols, the Binance Smart Chain, to throw out one, that are not very uh, decentralized at all. So don't let some of those imperfections, you know, taint the entire system. We know where we're trying to get in the DeFi system to a truly decentralized, permissionless world, where some are closer to it than others. But when you get to that type of world, I think it becomes a lot more stable. Look at the way that all of the protocols handled last May's or last month's 
crash in all of the coins. None of them failed. None of them had real slowdowns. I know the Polygon Bridge might have wobbled a little bit. And some of the pegs for a few minutes on some of the cable coins wobbled for a few minutes. But look, that was a lot better than they did in March of 2020. Uh, and it was a lot better than they did in the winter of 18 with the ICO failures as well, too. So the system continues to get better. And ultimately, what it is, is the, the digital financial services system for the digital currencies of which a centerpiece of those digital currencies is Bitcoin. Well, I, I would disagree on this whole idea that this it's a spectrum of decentralization. You either have uh, self-sovereignty over your own assets or you don't, and you simply don't in a decentral uh, DeFi uh, contract or whatever. It, it, you you have mean, multiple over, layers over, of various- You're way overstating it. Way overstating it. No, 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 no. It's true. It's it, not you, a you either It is not it, a Yes, it is. You, do, you, do you own it your is. asset or do you not? That's it. it. That's it. Do you, do you either have possession over your own stuff or you don't? Guys, and let's, if you uh, have possession let's set up over the context your own stuff, for this question. Then... Let's set up the context for this question because I want to make sure that our viewers are following the debate. Uh, Jimmy, when you talk about self-sovereignty, what does that mm -hmm. mean to you and why do you think it's important? Actual possession of your own stuff. So can someone take it away? Can the government take it away? Can some third party take it away? Can, uh, can they control your stuff? And, uh, and basically not have you possess your own stuff. Um, so yeah. with Bitcoin, you actually possess your own stuff. Uh, with the dollar, you don't, you, you don't really. If you keep it at the bank, then the government can seize it for all sorts of reasons, including uh, accusing you of being a domestic terrorist or uh, you know, a drug dealer or a child pornographer or something, and, and in, in which case they can just take it away. Um, furthermore, they can inflate your money away. So you, you might have even you know, hard cash in your uh, right. In your uh, in your vault or something like that, but if they can inflate it away, then in a sense they're taking it away from you as well. Well, well what's um, interesting wait, to me well, is that you guys—it seems that you guys are answering kind of different questions, right? I mean, I it sounds—it sounds like what you're talking about, uh, Jimmy, is the is the use case for Bitcoin, and and Jim Bianco is talking more about the uh, potential to displace some of the dollar-denominated transactions that take place. Uh, in the system. So I'm, I'm curious, uh, Jim Bianco, if you think that that's a valid way of representing it, do you think about it a little bit differently? I, I hear you talking about some of disintermediating some of the existing dollar infrastructure uh, and doing things uh, in the dollar differently. And that the goal that, you, that you're talking about is a very different one uh, than what uh, Jimmy is discussing. Oh, yeah, I think so. I, I definitely think so. I think that, uh, you know, there is, you know, financial services versus the monetary unit. And, you know, it may be, you know, Ethereum can become the monetary unit. I don't think it is now. I don't think it's trying to be that just yet uh, as well. But Jimmy, let me ask you a question. Should all of the, um, you know, you, you self-sovereignty, do you have self-sovereignty if you own Bitcoin and Coinbase? Should we close all the centralized exchanges? because they're not decentralized? Should Kraken, Gemini, Coinbase, Finance, all of those go away? Uh, as those well as are complete I mean, non sequiturs, because th those are centralized exchanges. And yeah, for people, people that want actually to... want to own their own stuff, you're supposed to go and take it out of those exchanges and you, put you it could do the your same thing in DeFi. Wallet you could do the same thing in DeFi. I can no, put no, you, my, well, you my can. coins. You can, you can, you you can, can attempt to do that. Storage. The thing is, the, the, the people that control those smart contracts, they could take it away. And in fact, this has happened in Ethereum, especially. Uh, you're familiar with what happened in 2016 with the DAO. It was a smart contract that somebody figured out, okay, well, I can drain it of all this money. And they decided, let's bail all of these people out. Instead of CODA's law, which was what, what, what they were supposed to be, instead they decided, okay, we're going to bail out all these people. One-sixth of all Ethereum was in that contract at the time. We're going to bail out all of these people that made a stupid decision to, uh, putting money into a smart contract they didn't understand. Um, and th this is not the only single point of failure on Ethereum. There's about five or six different ones, including Infura, which is uh, uh, almost entirely run by AWS. If Amazon decided, you know what, this is taking up way too much. It's not good. Uh, it, it doesn't make us enough money. We're going to just shut all of them down. Vast majority of Ethereum services would go down right away. And uh, and it's got lots of single points of failure. And it's a... Uh, uh, you, nobody has possession of their own stuff uh, the right. way you seem to think it does. It, it, it's 
uh, technically speaking, very, very centralized and uh, has multiple central single points of failure. So it's it's not at all about decentralization. It's it's completely centralized. It's a speculative frenzy. It doesn't innovate anything. It's just a bunch of people that are uh, creating tokens for themselves and printing money for themselves and uh, winning on the speculative frenzy. But uh, of course, those tend to uh, pop, those bubbles tend to pop. And, uh, you know, it, it's just sort of like an inevitable, uh, you know, end game that's going to happen. And a lot of people are going to be upset, just like they were in 2018 with the ICO bubble and so on. Um, and I, we, we've been warning people of this for many years, but people tend to just sort of ignore, oh, you know, the, my, my token's going up, so who cares? Um, but Jimmy, but, let me ask you an important devil's advocate question here. So the value of the S&P uh, 500 is approximately $30 trillion, right? People own Facebook stock, they own Amazon stock, they own Microsoft stock. Uh, none of those equities possess the attributes that Bitcoin does in the sense that they are very centralized. They can be taken away from you. Uh, they, um, the government, uh, you know, through due process of law here in the United States, at least, can attach those assets. They can seize those assets. You could be forced to forfeit those assets, uh, for example, if you lose a civil suit. Uh, so I guess the question is, uh, if the if other assets, if other traditional trad fi assets, U.S. equities, uh, bonds, currencies, commodities, all the traditional financial assets uh, that guys like Jim have been trading for decades, uh, don't possess the attributes that Bitcoin does, uh, which is a seems to me a very specific and important use case. Uh, why would people like Jim not want to be interested in digital assets that are doing similar things? Uh, yeah, I, um, I, I don't begrudge you trying to go f uh, find out like, uh, okay, this one's only this bad and this one's maybe slightly better. I, I, that, that's a calculation you can go make on your own. Uh, I, I, I've just seen that all of these uh, assets, especially in the crypto space with new tokens and so on, Right. Um, I, I've been observing for 10 years that, uh, you know, they pump, they dump, they like it, it's kind of not a very good investment, especially against Bitcoin, maybe against the US dollar, they do fine. But uh, against uh, against Bitcoin, they, they've they all done pretty terribly over like a period of five years and so on. So um, I, I don't see uh, the these things as uh, being uh, like good investments, especially against Bitcoin. So I, I, I don't see the real see a real need to uh, have to take additional risk, uh, uh, take on higher volatility, more risk uh, in terms of seizure and so on, um, and uh, in order to get a lower return. It doesn't really make any sense to me. So I, well, I, I'm not following this argument because you seem to be saying that there's too much speculation in a lot of these altcoins and they pump and they dump. And I, I agree with you, but therefore we have to go into Bitcoin because it speculates higher than everything else. It's the best returning asset. So, you know, you, you want it for all you people that want to chase the almighty return, go chase it in Bitcoin is what you seem to be saying. You're okay with wild speculation as long as that wild speculation pumps Bitcoin. So it sounds like you're just pumping Bitcoin right now and you're just against anything else that gets pumped. Again, Jimmy, I don't understand why you think DeFi is the problem. The problem is the Federal Reserve. The problem is the CFI banking system. The problem is the dollar. Both DeFi and Bitcoin are the solutions to that problem and this no, no, no bitcoin is the solution uh, DeFi has nothing to do with solving anything i i, I don't see it that way that, that is a laughable argument that is a laughable argument you can well, it's you laughable can say, because you you don't agree with no, it but I, because, I don't i don't see it as a, a, having any merit whatsoever because if you no, look you at DeFi, out, it's actually not decentralized it is uh, it, it's a bunch of altcoins that are pumping. You you even admitted earlier that most of the stuff that's in there is scammy or lots of people pumping and dumping and so on. Uh, so you're going to tell me you. now that this is some uh, great innovation that you should go into because uh, you know the it, it, it's at least not as bad as the Fed. Um, I I'm not so sure if that's even true. Uh, and, I think and, the and, Fed and, and the U.S. dollar are problems, but with Bitcoin. It isn't about a speculative frenzy. It is sound money. Those are very different things. And the reason why I promote Bitcoin is because it is actual sound money that you and it has uh, credible long term scarcity. All this other stuff doesn't. It's well, well let me ask you a question. Oh, let me ask you a question. Let me just jump in, guys. Let me jump in here and ask a question. So, so Jimmy, if if you believe in the use case 
for Bitcoin, it being sound money. I guess my question is, um, what about the need for other innovation uh, elsewhere in the financial system? Uh, is it not possible that Bitcoin can be the sound money store of value function in the digital asset space, but all of these other challenges that we have uh, in the traditional financial system that Jim knows so well, I'm curious if you think um, that w what should be done in terms of innovating there, uh, and is there not a possibility that there is a role uh, for something that looks like some of the functionality that is coming online in the DeFi space. I mean, I, I suppose it's possible, but for me, the the most of the problems, quote unquote, of the traditional finance system is due to the fiat monetary system that we all live under. It's all based on debt. It's uh, it's based on leverage, and there's way too much uh, sort of risk being taken out by the Federal Reserve. And essentially, you you add. Um, you, you make sort of like the digital versions of these that are just as centralized, that are just as, uh, you know, manipulative and speculative and so on um, in, in the DeFi space. I, I don't see that as really solving anything. It just allows uh, the, the people that are moving money around to make money, uh, like uh, another place to go do something similar, uh, except with, uh, you know, a different set of suckers, essentially. So, uh, and, and instead of, um, you know, how, getting the benefits of the Cantillon effect in, uh, in, in the U.S. dollar. Now you can just go print your own money with uh, your own token and uh, make, make money that way. Um, that, that, that's not really solving things per se. Um, Bitcoin actually solves a real problem, and it is storage of value over time. Uh, whereas all of these DeFi things, they're, they're solving like, tertiary peripheral uh, problems at best. I, I, I don't see it as solving something fundamental about the economy, about, uh, about problems that real people have. It's, uh, it's about problems that an investment banker might have with respect to getting the right amount of leverage on a particular trade, something to that effect. Fin financial intermediation is a big issue, and that is what it's trying to solve. It is not just an, it is fine to have a unit of exchange that has value, has the scarcity that you want. But in order to have proper financial intermediation is the grease that makes an economy go. You're putting sand in those gears. You need a borrowing way. You need lending. You need to be able to transfer. You need to be able to trade. You need to be able to recognize value in other types of assets. That's what we do in the New York Stock Exchange. That's what they're attempting to do with tokenomics in this space as well too. And yes, you can look at all of the, you can anecdotal all the failures, but if you were the mayor, you would say 95% of all restaurants that start in a city, and this is true, fail after a year. And down the block, somebody got salmonella poison at another restaurant. So Jimmy Song, mayor would say, close every restaurant and we will ban them forever because they all failed, they're all speculative, and some people got sick at one of them. That is not the way that you go about trying to create and evolve into a better system. It is risky, it will take some time, but it will get better. And yes, you are arguing for one part of this system, a sound version of money. And I agree with you on that, but there are other things that are necessary in financial intermediation for an economy to function properly. And that is what the rest of the decentralized finance world is trying to do. And I, I would I, I would say that th this has been the argument for the last ten years. Every single time, it's you know like most of this stuff is uh, is scammy and won't work or whatever. Uh, but the few that survive, th those are going to be great. Like I and said, I've been watching this space for ten years. There yes. hasn't been any innovation. Uh, every single time is, the narrative that is changes, like, that is it's, it, it's continuously that is, okay. Well, let's uh, th Jimmy, this thing's going got, to change you're, everything you're, or whatever. You're, it's, you're it's, projecting. It's you're projecting, man, because in the last ten years there hasn't been any innovation in Bitcoin. Bitcoin is there. Well, that no, I, I I really don't think you know what you're talking about. That <laughs> where are your borrowing and lending facilities? The smart contracts have been in Bitcoin being, since 2009, since it was yeah, but invented. Where is that stuff? It was all created. It's away all from still Bitcoin. there. People use it right now. Yeah, I mean, the the fact that you're saying that there hasn't been any innovation in Bitcoin tells me yeah, where, everything I need facility? to know. You where have zero idea facilities? of what is actually going on in Bitcoin. Do you, well, do you even know what Taproot does? Do you know what Taproot does? 
Yes, I understand. Okay, what does it do? Does. Tell me what it does then. Yeah, it's another one of a million trika things that's going to try and displace Ethereum. Good luck. That's what it is. Oh, is that what it is? Because yeah, that is right, completely waiting, not it. I'll be waiting for the millions of people that are going to run over there as soon as Taproot comes. And it only took you. Well, I mean, I, you don't even know what it is. You're 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 saying okay. Well, yeah, I know yeah, what I mean, it is. Where, you just where, didn't where describe it, it correctly, where is and you're it? saying that it has no innovation. That tells me that you don't know anything about Bitcoin, gentlemen. So let's let's talk about this for a second. So. Jimmy, what is Taproot? And tell us about what you believe right now is happening, because I think people, many people don't understand the case for smart contracts on Bitcoin. Give us a very brief introduction to that and what's happening right now today with it. Well, I, I can describe Taproot, but I, I really want to correct Jim here because smart contracts have been in Bitcoin since 2009. Everyone acts like, oh, okay, uh, Ethereum is the one that invented smart contracts as if that's their sole domain. No, smart contracts have been in existence since 1994. Okay, There were, there were people that were playing with smart contracts way back then. Um, they, they've just done a better marketing job of uh, making it sound like they're the only ones that know what smart contracts are. No, Bitcoin has had smart contracts since 2009. And every address that you send to is actually a smart contract. A lot of people don't know this because they're completely ignorant of what Bitcoin has been doing. And like Jim, think that, oh, you know, it hasn't innovated at all since 2009. You have no idea what you're talking about then. Uh, all right, but let's keep it. Let's keep it. Let's keep it on the issues here. Let's keep it on. Okay. The all right. So Taproot is one of one of the softworks uh, that that that's been on Bitcoin the last ten years, and it just locked in. Uh, but it, it, it is a really cool innovation because it gives you privacy over the various paths uh, uh, by which you can spend Bitcoin. So instead of revealing all of the different paths that uh, that that uh, a particular Bitcoin can be spent, um, you only reveal the one path that you actually spend with. Um, in addition, it doesn't have sort of like this uh, penalty associated with uh, the various paths. Um, you can have single sig or multi sig, and you you have no idea looking on chain. Um, it allows for a higher throughput as a result of that. Um, there's also something called Schnorr signatures that 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 it's a part of. You can do signature aggregation, um, it, and you can't even tell if it's uh, three of three uh, multi sig or one of one. Um, now these are right. all sort of like technical innovations that Jim is completely ignorant of because he doesn't study let's, any of this stuff. Let's keep Instead, it on the he issues, just goes guys, with. Guys, the, let's keep it on the issues. I, I, I'm just saying, like, it, when he says something so clearly uh, incorrect and saying, oh, Bitcoin hasn't had any innovation since 2009, right, right. that just tells me he only under uh, only listens to sort of the marketing drivel that comes out of places like Ethereum. And that's, you know, yeah, uh, well, it, it's very clear that he's extremely biased in his analysis of what's going let's on. Give, let's give Jim a chance to jump back in. Yeah, okay. Here's what I was saying, Jimmy. I, the history of technology in the history of competition is the marketplace decides what it thinks is best. And it is decided it is not Bitcoin when it comes to smart contracts. Oh, really? Is it? Yes. Is that right? Because yes. like Ethereum's uh, market cap's bigger than Bitcoin right now, isn't that? No, right? no. We're yeah, we're talking about on the smart contract and on the protocol level. They're not being created. The devs are over on the Ethereum network. They're not. That on is the Bitcoin. such a lie. The that, devs that is, are on Bitcoin. The people that are making script kitty contracts no, no, wait, on, wait, wait, wait. on, you, on Ethereum you, are not the, the one, same level of uh, developer you, as you're the, somebody you're that's the one, working you're on the, the protocol. That, those are very different one, things. You're the one that just said. You're the one that just said Bitcoin's the best. And everybody's an idiot that believes marketing drivel that doesn't go to Bitcoin. That is what every loser in a competition says. And that is, that is, doesn't I, matter I'm correcting what, it is. what you said, which was, oh, there's no innovation in Bitcoin. There, there is, is no innovation that's and utterly public, untrue. There is, and there is it, no I could prove it to you. I could show you all of the softwares. Instead, it you're ignoring it and saying, you know what? I'm going to just uh, impose my. Uh, worldview on everybody else and say, you know what, uh, uh, Ethereum is the one that's uh, more innovative because that's how I perceive it. That's just simply no, not true. Ethereum look at the is market the cap. Look at, look at the number of people that are into Bitcoin versus the people that are in Ethereum. It's very obvious that Bitcoin is the one that the market has chosen and not like uh, the, this alternate narrative that you're trying to impose on everybody. No, no, no. Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum is the one that you won the competition. It is the one where they're developing it. <laughs> Look, it one. is, Jimmy. It is. Where is your Uniswap? All right, then where, where is, is your market, market cap? Where's your market cap? 
Because well, if it won, okay, then it okay. would have a higher market cap than Bitcoin, wouldn't it? All right. So, Jimmy, let's pretend it's somewhere somewhere in the not too distant future and Ethereum is now larger. What's your argument then? Well, I'll take What's that bet all day long. Then? I'll take that bet all day long. You want to you bet on that? I, I will take that all day long. Give it, you, give it uh, five years. If you think that Ethereum will flip in Bitcoin, I will take that bet. Yeah, not only do I think it'll flip in Bitcoin, I think it's going to also flip the stable coins. It's going to be number three in five years, at least at that point. Well, I mean, the thing is, it, the fact of the matter is it hasn't flipped in Bitcoin. And uh, until then, you have uh, essentially what you just so said is so completely that's untrue. That, 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 that's your argument. There, there's more assets in the U.S. dollar. There's more assets in the U.S. dollar than there is in the banking system. It's basically what your argument is trying to say right now. So you, you are you, there are two different things. We're all let me just jump in here. Let me just jump in. We're all fortunate uh, that the market is taking these bets uh, right now and that we are actually going to have a resolution to this question uh, at some point in the future because we have price discovery uh, in this market, which is incredibly exciting. And we get to watch it and we get to see how it plays out. I'm really curious. Um, I just wanted to ask Jimmy Song about the, the current uh, the current use cases for Bitcoin smart contracts, uh, because this is something that I think I wasn't very familiar with actually until our most recent conversation. Tell us a little bit, because we do hear about Ethereum, if you, for example, uh, are just reading news at, uh, at Coindesk, at Decrypt, when you hear smart contracts, typically what you hear about is the Ethereum use cases. Tell us a little bit about what's happening in Bitcoin use cases and how they're being used today. Well, one, one of the bigger smart contracts on Bitcoin that's being continuously used is the Lightning Network. All of those are smart contracts as well. What you have to have is like uh, funding from various sources uh, in order to create a channel. And uh, those are locked by something called hash time like uh, contracts. Um, and they, they use uh, time locks in order to make sure that uh, you can settle everything uh, a, as you do these like lightning transactions and so on. Um, there, there's also like uh, the, uh, something called discrete log contracts, uh, which require an oracle um, <coughs> in order to resolve these contracts and so on. Um, and the nice thing about discrete law contracts is that they don't need a stupid third token. They just use Bitcoin natively. Um, and th this is, this has been my objection to all of these quote unquote DeFi protocols and so on. They create their own money in order to, uh, create a speculative frenzy around it, uh, which cause, uh, uh, which make it look like these uh, these contracts are utilized uh, way more than they are, when when in fact it's it's more about the speculative frenzy of the token and not about the actual uh, functionality introduced. Discrete lock contracts, you know, they're 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 being used for all sorts of things right now. Um, you can resolve various bets about uh, about the future. You can have um, you know call options that are res uh, that that are settled in Bitcoin and so on. Um, a, a lot of that stuff is working right now, um, and a lot of people are using uh, using them. Um, but you know, is, is this the main use case for Bitcoin? I don't think so, but, um, right. it is there and it is available. It's, uh, it, it's just that people like Jim don't really see Bitcoin's, uh, smart contract capability and said, uh, they're, they're, they're looking only at, uh, Ethereum and, uh, completely ignoring what's going on in Bitcoin because right. they, they, they're not, uh, he doesn't know what, what's going on basically. Let's throw back to Jim. I'm, I'm curious. It, now that we've heard the perspective from Jimmy about Bitcoin based smart contracts, I'm curious about what your bigger picture thoughts are about smart contracts, what you think the use cases for them are, and why is it that you're so interested in that space? Because obviously you, you have this vision uh, where you're very interested in some of the things that DeFi can build. What are some of those DeFi applications that you think are important, that you think that the world needs, and that you believe uh, support uh, and extend the functionality in the traditional financial system? Uh, well, I think that a couple of them, you know, for starters, if you wanted to look at the automatic market makers like the Uniswaps and the Sushis as well, too, and the constant product model that they use in order to uh, trade tokens, I think that that has the ability, if not now, very well soon, will, will be a better way to have a trading or organization over the traditional order book that you would see on the New York Stock Exchange. I think the collateralized borrowing and lending that you see on Aave, you see on Balancer, and the rest of them on, on Curve uh, and Compound is, is actually a more efficient way to do it than the current fractional banking system has been doing it now. Nexus Mutual, with the way that they've been putting together insurance contracts, has been very, very interesting as well. And underlying all of this is the idea of a stable point. A stable coin has the ability to be the big use case 
for the real world, the payment mechanism for the real world. And I agree that when I talk about a stable coin, I am not necessarily talking about Tether, Circle, or even DAI, because 52% of DAI's reserves is in Tether or Circle. Tether and Circle are not decentralized. That is a problem with them. But a purely decentralized, permissionless stable coin, of which they're still trying to create one right now, there are some that are coming along the ways, can be the big use case to be the big payment rail, I think, that connect the, the digital world to the real world as well, too. And along the way, it's not just Ethereum. You've got Cardano, you've got Solana, you've got DOT, you've got a lot of other world, uh, a lot of other protocols that are trying to come on. Look, I ultimately think that we're going to be a multi-chain world. We should be a multi-chain world. It is a country, it is a planet of seven billion people that make trillions of transactions for tens of trillions of reasons. It can't all be handled by a bunch of miners on one platform. A sound, a sound store of value can be that, but that cannot be everything to everybody. You're asking way too much of it. And again, I'll come back. Competition has been, has been done, and the investing public has made their decision as to which way they want to go when it comes to smart contracts and protocols. Yeah, Bitcoin has smart contracts. I get it. And so do a lot of other chains too. And we all know where all of the effort is being put right now. And it's not in the Bitcoin smart contracts as far as where the public wants to go. And I understand you want to dismiss that as being a bunch of suckers to marketing. But that's the way that all the losers always can say it's just they got suckered by marketing. That beta suckered everybody with marketing over our, our uh, DHS suckered everybody. I, I think you're completely ignorant better. of what's going on in Bitcoin. So, well, yeah. it, well then, well then, what we'll find in the next year or so is that if the smart con look, I'm a DeFi guy. I want to see DeFi. If your smart contracts take off and everything takes off, I will move over there like everybody else. But right now, all I hear is sitting on the end of the bed telling me how good it's going to be. And I'm waiting for that to happen. And that's a lot of what happens in this space uh, as well, too. So if it does take off, we'll all migrate over there is what, what, is what will happen. I got my watch out and I'm waiting for it to happen. You've had 13 years and I'm hoping that, you know, it won't take another 13 years uh, at this point. I don't see uh, DeFi as uh, as, as this uh, desperate thing that we all need in order for uh, you know the financial system or this entire space to run. Uh, the the killer killer product is store of value, and Bitcoin is a very good store of value. Um, I, I, I'm sure you, uh, Jim, want some sort of like uh, you know financial play thing so you can do. Uh, uh, you can make more money doing, uh, you know, some yeah, yeah. collateralized I'm a, I'm a, lending I'm a or whatever. I'm a greedy guy that wants play things, I right? Well, I, mean, I, a, look, I, mean, I, mean, I, I don't see this as something that Jimmy, people Jimmy, desperately need. I, I, I really don't. And the thing is, with Bitcoin, 7, you actually desperately need it. With all of this other, like, collateralized lending and, uh, you know, uh, DeFi things uh, that, that really aren't actually de decentralized, but have all of these tokens that are, uh, that, that are people printing their own money. None of the, that stuff is what people desperately need. Uh, what people desperately need is a way to be able to save. And, uh, you know, uh, like we said at the beginning, it's the Fed that is the enemy. Um, they, they are the ones that are able to take away your money, essentially through inflation. With Bitcoin, you can be free from that. With DeFi, what are you free, being free of? You're, you're what some uh, some uh, something that's like maybe five percent more efficient by using some no, it's not five percent more like efficient, having, Jimmy. Having Jimmy. Lot, lots and uh, why? Let, let me finish. I, the the idea is uh, you you seem to attach a significant amount of importance to DeFi, which I personally don't see. I don't think most people see. If you happen to be a financial professional that is on Wall Street and have done this for the last thirty years, maybe it makes sense for you. But for the vast majority of people that are actually, uh, you know, wanting some good financial way to save, um, that they they actually uh, the needs that they have, uh, Bitcoin actually fulfills some of the things that they need, um, wh whereas DeFi does not. And that's that's that I I, I don't see this as uh, critical in the least. Jim, and, and Ash, can I can I can I ask Jimmy a couple of questions on a, on a different subject because it kind of leads into it right now. Please. Um, 
you've been hammering away that it's not decentralized. Let me turn the tables and ask you, what do you think about the proposal, Michael Saylor's proposal about a Bitcoin mining council? How comfortable are you with that? And what do you think about what's been happening in El Salvador? And let me give it to you in a loaded way. Are you comfortable with the idea that a government is now going to use coercion to tell people that they must accept Bitcoin and that the government is going to create their own wallet that they, you can use to transact in Bitcoin? Is that the way you want the adoption of Bitcoin to go? And is, it, and is, it, and is a mining council, the idea of a mining council, a good idea as well too? Are those ideas that are, are along with your centralization uh, precepts? Well, I mean, th those are things that people are doing out on the market. Um, and I don't, I, I, I don't really necessarily have an opinion on either one because I, I like if Michael Saylor wants to do a uh, my mining council, then that's un entirely to him. Is it good for this space or bad? I reserve judgment. I have no idea. Um, so you, uh, let me, let me, let me stop you there. And let me, let me ask you. So the idea of a mining council that potentially could be an authority to give permission to miners as long as they meet certain green standards or other standards. I and think you're you mischaracterizing it. I have so no idea the, that's what exactly is, what it is. Right. We don't know what it is, but that's the fear of what but, it I mean, could but be. you're kind of making like a like a boogeyman out of it. You're saying yeah, oh, well, what, they're well, going to give permission to violent miners to mine or not. Uh, that's not what he said. It, it, it then is what supposed is it? to be in the then mining council. What's the point of it? I don't what's know what point? it is, and I'm, I'm I'm reserving judgment because I don't know much about it, right, and I don't about, think you do either. The... Unless you have uh, direct quotes from Michael no, but I, saying, I, "Hey, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna give permission to certain miners to mine, and others not." Uh, I mean that that's a that's a really terrible sort of like characterization of what's going on. Well, that's the way and you're that you're trying to trying to impute on me like okay, well you 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 have to support this because it's uh, it's people in Bitcoin that are doing it. I, I, right? I, no, I, no. I reject I, that notion what's look, the, in, look, in every way. The argue, the, the, the characterization I gave you is the characterization Elon Musk tweeted out about it, and he was in the meeting. And he was. Well, in I mean, the that's meeting. Elon Musk. Uh, yeah, we, but he we, was. We know in the what meeting. he's been doing though. I, but I mean, I, I don't trust Elon Musk. So whatever you say that Elon Musk said about this thing, All right, I don't how about think so, it was how about El Salvador? True. How about El Salvador? Are you are you okay with the idea that governments will coerce people to use Bitcoin? Is that what the ultimate goal of Bitcoin was? Is to force it on populations via government diktat? Is that a good idea? I don't think I, I don't think that's a correct characterization either. Uh, look, there's already something in El Salvador called, called Bitcoin Beach that was very popular before uh, Bukele did anything with it. So, uh, like you're you're trying to spin it everything in a way the as to be negative say... for Bitcoin. I have reserved judgment on all this stuff. Don't try to put words in my mouth and say, "Oh, you must believe this," and th therefore Bitcoin is bad. No, no, uh, no. That, that, no I, but... I think that's what that's the direction you're trying to go with this thing and no, trying no, to no. The direction uh, sort of I'm make trying... a make a really bad straw man and say, "Oh, therefore, like uh, Ethereum is better" or something like that. No, no, no. I, no, I, I, I don't. I, I, I think what they're doing. I don't know exactly how it's going to be implemented or whatever. Um, all indications are that it's already something that was already popular and that they are codifying it to some degree with their laws. That's it. Yes, it is. Yes. But then they're also putting into their laws that it, it must be accepted is, is, is where yeah, I mean, it, it's one thing to put it into the laws. Um, it, it's another to enforce it on a daily basis. Are they going into, go, are they going to go into every small business and, uh, test them to see if they uh, take lightning payments, and if they don't, then arrest them. I don't think so. I and uh, and you know there, there's uh, the practical reality of a law versus what's written on the books, and those tend to be very different anyway. See, but isn't this what you isn't this what you've been doing with Ethereum during this conversation? Is you've anecdotally found oh Cuban got rug pulled yesterday, or something happened with Cuban losing his money over the yeah, yesterday? I mean, the, and there's a bad DeFi contracts have here. been like exploited all day long for many months now. Yeah, uh, but and, 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 and like you you seem to be ignoring all of them. Oh, it doesn't matter. It's uh, it, no, it's it does matter. It does matter that they are being exploited and it is a problem but it is getting better and it is orders of magnitude how do you know that it's getting better there, there's all there, there's like an exploit every week how can you possibly say that because these are because every one of these exploits you and i know the same thing about them right 
you find out about, you learn about the existence of that thing the day it gets exploited. These are marginal stuff on the edges that people didn't really understand uh, as well, too, to begin and there, with. And there's no evidence that people are attempting to understand them any better. In fact, well, you know, putting yeah, money well, into this stuff, it hasn't gotten any better. Uh, your your oh, assertion got, that no, it is, is it's without merit. Orders. It's it's without basis. It's just, I think that I think it'll get better in the future, therefore it's getting better. You, you no, have no evidence of that. Better, it, it continues Jimmy, to. It is getting better. Th it, then why are you still getting exploited? It's happening every week. You know, and come back to yes. So you're you're going to make the perfect the enemy of the good, and you're going to say that because DeFi is not perfect, therefore it, there's no innovation. If, when just it comes like in to my people's example, money, if you example, have the ability to lose it, or if you have, uh, if if you're promoting the entire DeFi space, and a lot of it is causing people to lose money. Yeah, I am going to be upset about New York that. You're saying, oh, you know what? Uh, a money. few broken eggs are fine. You know, it's it's only people. All people. right, how about, how about, I, I think that's so, stupid. Yeah, and in the New York Stock Exchange, there are companies that go bankrupt all the time. There are problems with there. There are people being arrested for violating law. We should close that down too. Just like I said, down the hall, down the street, somebody got sick at a restaurant, we should close every single restaurant as well too. You want this to be perfect. Otherwise, it shows no innovation. Are you? You really no, want, I don't to, want it you to really be want perfect. To make that I, 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 that there's well, actually, no with smart contracts, they should be because if it's not perfect, then you're going to lose money. And there's a lot of people losing money. You're, you seem to be okay. Oh well, you lost money. Sorry, sorry for your loss. But as long as I get to play in this uh, DeFi world and See, move now, money now around and be able to make money that way, everything again. is fine. That 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 seems to be your attitude. Do you um, believe I, in capitalism? I think that's a, a that's completely like out of whack. Do you what believe most in people capitalism? Are thinking of uh, if you want to do a speculative frenzy, be my guest. You go do that. But to say, okay, well, uh, a few people lost money, but that doesn't matter because you know, like uh, you know, we're still innovating and it'll get better later. I, I think, I, I think that's just. Do you believe in capitalism? <laughs> You, you, uh, you, it's a you simple keep question. up like a, non sequiturs as if no, you're, you're yeah, going to I, prove so some great point no. when in fact you're you know, all so you're saying is, is no. well i want i want to say uh this uh the uh, i'm going to bring in this abstract concept and uh that's going to prove you wrong no 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 uh, I, I'm, I don't I'm, think I'm, you've I'm proven saying, anything i'm saying I'm saying, do you believe in capitalism? Do you believe in risk taking? Do you believe in competition? Do you believe that there will be winners and losers? And that is what you're seeing in this space. You are saying that no, you have what, zero what you're tolerance. seeing are people you that have, are printing their own money and exploiting a lot of people, and you seem to be completely okay with that. No, I'm not okay with it. I'm not okay with it. I didn't say I'm okay with it. Just like I'm not okay with companies. That what do you mean? Up. You just said, I'm oh, you're okay. making the perfect enemy of good. If it's not perfect, then uh, then then I mean, that's you, exactly you, you've been arguing are. the whole time that you need everything. A anyone can go do but, whatever but they space, want as long as this uh, DeFi space is trying to do things that is not being done the DeFi the space is exploiting a lot of people it is causing it is a lot of people value to lose and money opportunity. and you it, seem to be saying oh don't let the perfect be the enemy of good it's fine no well, i never well, said well listen fine. right there right there we seem to have the core argument about this on the one hand jimmy you believe it's uh, about exploiting people on the other uh jim believes that it's creating value uh it's really interesting for me listening to the conversation uh because it's two very different uh points of view uh i'm not sure that we've had any resolution to this uh obviously but i think that the people who have been watching uh have learned a lot about both sides of this argument i think it's been incredibly valuable for them to hear this and to have it discussed at this incredibly high level. Uh, before we go, before we close this out, why don't each of you just give an opportunity uh, to tell us about your final thoughts, what you'd like our viewers to leave with, what the key takeaways are from your arguments. Uh, first to you, Jimmy. Well, I, I would say that the, uh, DeFi is not, nothing really new. It's centralized finance, it's people printing their own money. This has been going on since 2011, and we've had multiple Scambrian explosions of various tokens. Most of the stuff from 10 years ago, you probably don't even recognize. Guy Skeld and IX coin and, uh, you know, Tenebrix and uh, coins like that. You, you haven't heard any of them because they are all gone. They, they, they have gone into the dustbin of history. Um, the few that did survive from that era, like Litecoin, um, it, it, they're not doing anything innovative uh, in the least in the in the last uh, five years or so. Um, 
Now, J Jim's going to argue that there's uh, there, there's all of these uh, new things that DeFi is somehow different than uh, the altcoins of 2011, 2013, 2017, and so on, uh, that it, it actually brings innovation in some way, shape, or form. And maybe he's right. Maybe maybe there is something that that it might uh, might possibly make sense in the future. Um, if it is, you can afford to wait. Uh, you don't need, you don't desperately need to uh, invest in them right now. You can wait five years and if it's still around and uh, doing something useful, then you can go invest in it then. You don't have to wait, uh, you, don't, you don't have to like jump in, dive in uh, and uh, invest in this stuff like all these DeFi protocols want you to do. Um, instead, you can wait and if it's actually useful five years from now, you'll see something that, that that's uh, fine. And I, I think in that regard, he and I would agree like, you don't, you don't have to invest in it right now. You, it, there, there's no desperate need. With Bitcoin, you actually do need it right now because the dollar is getting diluted through inflation. Uh, you need a good way to uh, save money over the long term and Bitcoin gives you that. Uh, whereas with all of these DeFi projects and uh, weird, weird tokens where people are printing their own money, they, they have no real credibility. They're uh, just relying on speculative frenzy and a lot of other momentum and marketing that's going on. Um, uh, you, you don't need to do that. So uh, I would say keep it in Bitcoin. And if, if there is anything that is useful, you'll find out five years from now and you can do it then. And uh, there's no need to uh, you know, get get into all of the complicated DeFi stuff, which most people don't understand that you really need to be a financial uh, Wall Street veteran of many years in order to even understand what the heck is going on in a lot of this stuff. With Bitcoin, it's a lot simpler. The value prop is a lot easier uh, to understand. And it is something that we need going forward. Jim, I think I heard the shadow of some common ground there. Uh, what are your final thoughts? I, I just think that, you know, I don't think Jimmy and I are that far apart, to be honest with you, if Jimmy would just, you know, accept that we're two sides of the same coin, that Bitcoin needs DeFi and DeFi needs Bitcoin. They both work well together, that one of them is putting together the architecture and the other one is the currency for right now. Uh, capitalism has always been about the idea that competition and evolution will always take place. The 90% of all the companies that have ever been listed in the New York Stock Exchange's 200 year history have gone bankrupt and out of business. 90% of the restaurants have gone bankrupt and out of business. And 90% of all of the coins that have ever been created have gone bankrupt and out of business. This is the way that we have evolution. This is the way that we have change. This is the way that we have improvement in the world. We don't wait for somebody to announce that they found the ultimate solution to a problem. That's it. You never have to innovate anything else anymore. So what Bit, what DeFi is trying to do is create financial intermediation in a, in a digital place by removing the middleman and the regulations and the costs and the bureaucracies associated with it, it will dramatically, dramatically reduce the costs for, it would dramatically open up the access for everybody else and will open up the creativity. The argument that it's just a marginal change, it's the same argument the newspapers made about blogs, it's the same argument that the uh, taxi companies made about rideshare, it's the same argument that the hotels made about Airbnb, and they were wrong. These were orders of magnitude increases of efficiency and cost savings. And that's what you're seeing in the DeFi space. And yes, just like the regular capital space of centralized finance, lots of stuff goes bankrupt. It is not a guaranteed place to make money. If that's what you want, then maybe you should be in Bitcoin and you should consider it a store of value and buy.